So it's 2024 and the a7s 3 is close to four years old now. There's maybe too many body updates released for this chip and sensor combo, mainly being the FX3, the ZVE1, the FX6. They're all the same platform and that's fine, I guess, if you're okay with money grabs. But how does the original stack up in today's landscape? In my opinion, it's the go-to on the market. The R5C is out, but I don't love C-Log. Lumix only has a competitor for the A7 IV, and it's good, but the A7S III is only second to the FX3 in this section of camera. And arguably, that's not the same category because we have an EVF and a mechanical shutter, which makes a big difference for photos. And with the Lightroom Enhance feature, 12 megapixels can be turned into 48. So why is the A7S III still top dog in my opinion? That starts with video specs. The video is just so damn good coming out of this thing, especially in S-Log3. And if you're too lazy to grade log, S-Cinetone was added a while back, and that is the best profile for out-of-camera footage, and the 422 10-bit footage is superb in every way and captures all the information you need for a real color grade. The dynamic range is amazing on this thing and it's not already good, but compared to Canon cameras, it's amazing. I always shoot log to make a highlight to mid-tone roll off and it creates an amazing image, thanks to that dynamic range we spoke about earlier. The 12 megapixel sensor, though not the best for photos, it's definitely amazing for low light performance. I mean, I can comfortably film in darker spaces than I could with other cameras and not fear working with the footage in post like I used to. And that is from the low megapixel count. The dual native ISO with the 12,800 felt like a bit much, but after pushing this camera in low light capabilities time and time again, I fell in love with it. And I hope that that type of ISO split stays on the next version of either the FX3 Mark II or if the a7s IV actually comes out. The 4K 120 with almost no crop is amazing as well, which isn't really seen in most cameras out there and definitely not as usable. So if you want slow-mo B-roll, this is definitely the one. Next up is raw output. The majority of YouTubers aren't going to need it, but it's there and it's good. And it was used to film the creator on the FX3. Truthfully, for the majority of work most people are doing, I can't see going past all intro with how good that codec really is. But even more than video, we have photo. And though this camera is essentially a budget cinema camera lacking some pro features, the photography is still amazing on this thing. And if you're doing retainer contracts and have photos baked into that contract for social, this will do that. Though switching to photo from video is a pain, unless you're using the top dial, which also is a pain, so I can't actually say that it's in the same bracket with newer camera bodies like the a7 IV that just has a toggle switch. And thanks to the fast sensor readout, you can do the FPS e shutter, and that actually is usable. And it's way better than the a7 IV because the e shutter isn't great on that camera compared to this. And paired with the enhanced feature in Lightroom, you now can crop in during post. The file sizes are going to jump up but if you need only one camera to do what you need it to do, this is definitely the one. The EVF is amazing and I'm not sure why they put it on a video first camera, but hell yeah. This camera has the same drive modes as the a7 IV, so you're able to do timers, bracketing, and everything else you need. But one thing that makes this camera stand out is its heat dissipation. And that leads me to the heat sink on this thing. See, when this camera came out, Sony was going head to head with Canon. And during those times, Peter McKinnon was a king of YouTube that no one would shut up about. There's still a ton of influencers that reference coffee and cameras all the time. I do with my podcast. And Parker Walbeck was a Canon ambassador as well. And he only shot with Canon at the time. But this was the definitive blow Sony needed on Canon when it happened. The a7S III and the a7 IV were competitors to the R5, which is the a7S III, and the R6, which is the a7 IV. And the first version of both those bodies were marketed for video-centric features. Canon got stuck on resolution and touted 8K and 4K HQ, which was downsampled 8K to 4K. But this takes a lot of processing power. 
and it became apparent that Canon wasn't paying attention to runtime. And these cameras were known to overheat even going through the menus. And though they released firmware updates that kind of help, it wasn't fixed until the Mark IIs were released, but in the R5's case, the R5C. Sony didn't have these problems. The A7S III could run two hours easy, and the A7 IV could overheat and does overheat under certain conditions, but nothing like Canon. The a7 IV downsampled 7K to 4K without touting it as a feature. The reason this is important is because the same heatsink was used in both systems. The a7 IV shows how amazing the heatsink in the a7S III really is. And all these years later, it still chugs along, and even the newer vlogging-centric cameras in their lineup can't replicate the runtime on this thing. So is the a7S III still worth it in 2024? Yes. Yes it is. In my opinion, it is still unmatched in this section of the market, other than the FX3. Canon can't really touch it. Lumix hasn't released the S1H2, which is probably gonna be called the S1X. And if they do, it will be more comparable to the original A7S III, but with a higher megapixel count and the A7S III or FX3 Mark II will be an absolute game changer. Whether it's IBIS paired with internal ND, 6K with full phase detect autofocus with RAW, whatever Sony does, they're ahead of the competition. And though their firmware support sucks, their cameras are reliable, fast, feature packed, and are amazing. So if you're on the fence, grab the A7S III.